I hope you're going to enjoy this. Uh, Hosea chapter 5. And before we get started, let's open in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you this morning, and I do thank you, God, for giving us this book. I thank you, God, for giving us this church. I thank you, God, for the brothers and sisters that are here. And I thank you, Lord, for the blessing they've been to me over the years. And I hope that I've been a blessing to them as well. And I hope, Father, that uh, our friendships and relationships can continue. And uh, please guide and direct your people that are here as to what you'd have them to do. And thank you, Lord, for the fact that, uh, Lord, you are coming back soon. And I pray, Father, you'd help us all to be found faithful at your return, uh, each within our individual lives and families and wherever you direct us from here on out. Father, I do pray you bless the Word of God this morning, and I pray you give your people understanding and uh, challenge their thinking and uh, give them a love for your book here this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. I also want to say, uh, you know, before I get started, I really appreciate the Pedans and Mark. You know, he's been teaching Sunday school for me for the last, well, since he's basically got here, and I graduated with him in 2011 from PBI, and I have to say, if it wasn't for Mark, I don't think this church would be here. I don't think I could have done it without him. So Mark has done a great job, and I'm very appreciative for Mark. And uh, he, was a, he was a godsend. He was, a, he was an answer to prayer. He was someone that God brought at the right time. And, uh, you know, so be, continue to be praying for him. You know, he's got to seek the Lord's will for him and his family. I know what my will is for him for, and for his family, but uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I'm not God, you know, and I don't pretend to be God. You know, I'm not that pastoral authority type where I'm going to try to be the fourth member of the Trinity and, you know, just kind of push the Holy Spirit to the side. I'm not like that. So, <laughs> all right. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Hosea chapter five, verse uh, 15. Let's start there. Uh, the Lord says, uh, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. And then it says in chapter 6, verse 1, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. All right, I'm getting started a quarter after, just for the record. All right, right here, uh, tucked away in the minor prophets, in the uh, you know sticky pages of a lot of people's Bibles, uh, is a, I believe, a major key when it comes to understanding God's timeline of the future. And in the Bible, you have to understand that God does not hesitate to predict the date and the the what and the when and the how of future events. As a matter of fact, God's ability to foretell the future through the scriptures is one of the things whereby he proves his deity and uh, that he is the true God above all other gods. And so the Bible is the most remarkable book on this planet for many reasons, and one of which is because it confidently records history from the beginning of time to the end of time. The Bible states how and when things began, and the Bible states how and when things will end. And there's no other book on this planet that can do that. You do understand that, right? I mean, the Quran is a joke. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is a joke. You know, the Egyptian Book of the Dead is a joke. You compare all those books to the Bible, it's a joke. This book, confident, doesn't even apologize for its statements. It starts out with, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, with no apology for the evolutionists. It just states that's what it is, to like it or lump it, right? That's how the Bible is, amen? And uh, God doesn't care how people feel about it. But uh, today we find ourselves on the timeline in between those two climaxes of the beginning and the end, all right? And uh, so far, where we're at, the Bible has proven up until this point, the year 2021, the Bible has been proven to be true. And it's been proven to be true in regards to its instructions regarding morality. You're not going to go wrong obeying the Bible. It's been proven to be true regarding its warning concerning the consequences of sin. It's been proven to be true concerning its scientific statements regarding the natural creation. And it's, it's been true according to its historical records. It's been proven to be true concerning its genealogies. And many of the prophetic statements in this Bible have already been fulfilled. There are a lot of prophecies in this Bible. Some are still future, but many of them have already been fulfilled, and we can see that. And uh, so given that the Bible has been true thus far since the beginning of its uh, publication, roughly 1450 B.C., it's reasonable to assume that its statements and prophecies will continue to be true. That's logical. If it's been true for thousands of years, why would it not continue to be true? 
Okay, that's a re reasonable argument. And after all, like I said, name me one book on this planet that has a track record like the Word of God. You can't find one. Now, this particular passage here in Hosea, I believe, is the key uh, to understanding the date of the Lord's return, or in theological terms, the uh, the coming of Christ. And when I say the coming of Christ in this passage, I'm not referring to the rapture of the church. I'm referring to the return of Jesus to the earth, what we call in theological terms the second advent. Now, uh, the idea that the scriptures contain the date of Jesus' second coming should not really be that su surprising. Because after all, don't you remember that the scriptures contain the date of the Messiah's first coming? Right? Daniel 9.25 Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. Remember? Daniel prophesied about when the Messiah would come. Right? He didn't, there wasn't an understanding back then that there were two comings. They all thought it was one. But nevertheless, there was a date given for the coming of the Messiah. And that's in Daniel chapter 9. The reason why the three wise men knew when the Messiah would be born, or roughly thereabouts, was because they had been studying Daniel's writings. They weren't given special revelation. They weren't some uh, mystical, you know, heathen priest that the angel of the Lord showed up to and said, Hey, Here's some special information that I'm going to give to you and nobody else. It wasn't one of those Joseph Smith kind of things, right? It wasn't one of those Muhammad kind of things. It was a thing where they'd been studying the writings of Daniel, because he had been over in Babylon, you remember, and they understood his writings, and they understood the timing. They'd been studying it. God, uh, they, they read, studied, and believed the scriptures, and eventually they figured it out. They figured it out. I believe with the help of the Holy Spirit they figured it out, but they figured it out. They showed up, they understood before the Pharisees in Jerusalem knew. And so I believe, personally, that the same can be true of the date of the Lord's return, His second coming. Now, whenever somebody starts talking about date setting, let's say, you know, Christians get nervous, and maybe for good reason. But uh, reason number one is because they misunderstand Mark 13.32. Go ahead and turn there. And while I'm talking, hold your finger in Hosea 5, because that's our key text this morning. But Mark 13.32, there's a misunderstanding of this verse, and the idea is that's generally preached in most, uh, you know, fundamental Baptist churches, at least that I'm familiar with, or Christian denominational churches, is no one can know the day or the hour. And so, therefore, anyone who even uh, thinks they know is either deceived or deluded, and it's borderline blasphemy. I've heard that, too. All right, and then the other reason, I'll come back to Mark 13, but the other reason why a lot of people get nervous about date setting is because uh, there have been many Bible teachers over the last few hundred years that have set dates and literally have built entire uh, doctrines and entire denominations around date setting. For example, Charles Russell, the founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses religion, the 144,000 and all that, that entire religion is built around a date setting of the second advent of Christ. And the 144,000 and all that, the Jehovah's Witnesses, he blew it. And he got it completely wrong, and so have many others, and consequently, those date setters have indirectly ruined the lives of a lot of people in the process and created a lot of false doctrine. So I'll comment briefly on those two things real quickly. But uh, the first reason why a lot of Christians, you know, get really leery of any kind of date setting is because of a, it has to do with ignorance, number one. And that's Mark 13, 32. Jesus said this, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Now just uh, so you know, I'm going to go kind of quickly through some of this so I can get to the, my main point at the end. Uh, but I have a lot of information here, so I'm going to talk kind of quick. But, um, and we've gone over a lot of this before, so I don't want to rehash this too much. But uh, basically, Mark 13, 32, when Jesus said, No man knoweth the day or the hour uh, of the coming of the Son of Man is the context of what he's talking about there. But nobody knows about the Father. This has absolutely nothing to do with the rapture of the church. Mark chapter 13, Matthew chapter 24, those are the two places where Jesus says no one knows the day or the hour. Literally, that is not talking about the, the rapture of the church. That is a reference to the second advent, all right? So, uh, even though for hundreds of years, preachers have taken Mark 13, 32, and have said, well, therefore, because Jesus said that, nobody can know the day of the rapture, so quit trying to figure it out. Well, I'm sorry, that's a false teaching. 
That's not what Jesus said. Jesus is talking about His return to the earth as King. He said, Of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels in heaven, but neither the Son, but the Father. All right? So, nothing in the entire chapter has to do with the, the rapture of the church. The whole thing is about Israel and uh, the Jews and the Great Tribulation. So, since he's referring to the second advent, okay, that at least opens the door that maybe people could know the date of the rapture. Okay? It's, it's, it could be arguable. All right. And also pay attention to this. Pay attention that Jesus said, of that, what, day? And that hour knoweth no man. Did you catch that he didn't say, no man knoweth the month or the year? He didn't say that. He said day and hour, not year. Okay? So that leaves that open to interpretation. Maybe you could find out the year. You just not know the day or the hour if you wanted to take, take him at his word there. So you need to pay t close attention to the wording of the Bible. Furthermore, you should also consider, and I'm, 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 I believe I've taught this to a lot of you, and so most of you already know where I stand on this, and I've explained this, but for the people that might be tuning in, there's another thing that Christian the Bible believers need to consider. Uh, it is possible that it might be that just simply at that time, when Jesus spoke that, nobody knew the day or the hour. But now that John has been given the revelation, right, and the book has been opened by the Father on the throne, the book that no man could open or look upon or see, and now it's opened and given to Jesus, and then it's given to John, well, this verse might be obsolete now because of the book of Revelation being published. So it could be that at the time of Jesus, before His death, burial, and resurrection and glorification, nobody knew, but now they do. That's a possibility. So what I'm saying is you've got to think a little bit. You don't get stuck into this tradition rut, where, well, this is the way we've always taught it, this is the way my pastors taught it, this is the way my denominations taught it, so therefore that's what I believe. That's foolish. Uh, reason number two has to do with irresponsibility. All right, People get nervous about day sitting because people get irresponsible. All right, So the first one's ignorance, the second one's irresponsibility. And let me just say this, back in 2010 there was an old rich man named uh, Forrest Fenn and he decided to hide uh, some of his treasure. He was a very rich man he decided to hide some of his fortune in a treasure chest in the wilderness of the southwestern United States, and he published a riddle that contained hidden clues as to the location of this treasure. Has anybody heard of this guy? Okay. And uh, I, I just heard about it. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, various artifacts and precious things were in this treasure chest that they estimated to be worth of upwards of $2 million. And Forrest Fenn's game was this. Whoever found the treasure and solved his riddle got to keep it. Two million dollars. <laughs> and so as you can imagine, it created a frenzy of activity, you know, and people from every walk of life and from all over the world quit their jobs, came to the U.S., you know, and started looking for this treasure, and we're just digging all over the South. I mean, it wasn't just in one little case. It was like the Western United States is somewhere over there, okay? <laughs> and so uh, they went looking for it and for a chance to be literally an overnight millionaire. And uh, the treasure actually remained undiscovered for years, because remember, he buried it in 2010, or he hid it in 2010. And the longer the location remained a mystery, you know, and they'd have these online chat forums about where it could be and look at this clue and this in this riddle and let's think about this word and that word and what did he mean by this? You know, people became more and more obsessed with finding it. And one problem that started to emerge at this time was that inexperienced people who were interested in getting rich would go out into the forest thinking that they'd solve the riddle and uh, they'd go looking for the treasure and they'd end up getting themselves lost or putting themselves in danger. And Forrest Fenn himself stated multiple times, for the record, that the treasure was not in a dangerous location, nor would you have to risk your life in order to find it. Uh, nevertheless, people searched for this treasure in the bottom of ravines, on the sides of cliffs, underneath rivers. You know, they'd be digging and doing all this stuff. And uh, you can imagine what happened. <laughs> people started to get hurt. There were a couple people that died searching for the, in the pursuit of this treasure. And so the question that was raised within law enforcement and the media was, should Forrest Fenn be held liable for the deaths of these people? What do you think? And, uh, you know, Forrest Fenn stated, on, you know, before the media, and I don't know if it was before the courts also, but he said it, it wasn't his fault that people made really stupid decisions while looking for his treasure, and the legal system had to reluctantly concur. 
It's not his fault. He, he stated that it wasn't in a dangerous location. Just because a lot of people did very stupid things when looking for his treasure didn't mean that he was wrong for hiding the treasure, wrong for making the riddle, uh, and, and should be held liable. Okay? It didn't mean that he should be held liable. Now listen, the same thing is true with the date of the Lord's return. That knowledge is certainly a treasure hidden within the pages of the Word of God. I have no doubt that it's in here. Whether somebody's figured it out or not, that's another story. But I do believe it's in here. And, uh, when looking, and so there's nothing wrong with looking for that treasure. There's nothing wrong with trying to figure it out or even speculating as to when it could be. But if you think you have figured it out, and then you... You know, you think, oh, it's going to be here within October. You know, I've heard that one. This October. Okay? If you think it's next October, and then you sell all of your possessions, you quit your job, and you rack up a bunch of credit card debt, thinking that the Antichrist will have to pay it off, well, don't blame yourself if you discover that you are wrong and made a complete and total wreck out of your life. Listen, even if you knew the date of the rapture, even if you knew without any shadow of a doubt this is the day even if you knew it wouldn't give you a license to sin and it wouldn't give you a license to be a fool and it would not relieve you of your christian responsibilities period okay so now i know there are some false prophets out there who will state emphatically that they know the date you know and they'll say thus saith the lord the date is going to be you know You've got that. you got that guy putting on the big billboards. Remember that a few years ago? You know, the rapture is going to be October of this year, and then it ended up not being it. And then he was like, no, 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 no. I got one little thing wrong. It's going to be this year. And then and, and nothing happened. You put billboards up. <laughs> Man, you know, you got some false prophets that will say, the Lord showed me that the date is going to be this. Okay? And they literally claim to prophesy the date. Okay? Now, that's not what I'm doing this morning. I want to make that very clear. What I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to show you some scriptures that might contain the date, might give you some information per per pertaining to a possible date, and I will tell you what my opinion is, the opinion of Matt Crane. Okay, I'm no different than you, I'm just another Christian who loves the book, loves God, I'll tell you what my opinion is. Maybe your opinion will be different. But I'll tell you what my opinion is based on the evidence. I do not claim to know for sure, and I do not claim to be a prophet. All right? Period. So that's pretty easy. I do believe that the answer is in this book somewhere. I do believe that. I do believe that it is possible that someone could figure it out. I do believe that. I do believe that the information I'm going to present is worth your consideration. I do believe that. And your responsibility, as always, is to prove all things and hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21. So let's get started. All right, Hosea chapter 5. Uh, by the way, Forrest Fenn's treasure was found in 2020, so don't bother go looking for it, okay? They've already found it. <laughs> Hosea chapter 5, verse 15. All right, I'm not even there. All right, Hosea 5.15, he says, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense... And seek my face. In their affliction, they will seek me early. All right? So what is that talking about? Uh, Israel has had a lot of offenses against the Lord. You can't even number them. <laughs> so which of these offenses is he referring to? Remember, it says offense for their offense. Singular. Not plural. Singular. There's something in particular that the Lord is just a little aggravated about when it comes to the nation of Israel. What offense is he talking about? Keep reading. Verse 1 of chapter 6. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us. This is the nation of Israel speaking. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. All right? So it says that the nation of Israel in the context is going to be torn and smitten and then healed and raised up. Now what does that sound like? You could say that the tearing and the smiting, maybe that has to do with Rome in 70 AD blowing up Israel and all that stuff. But Israel has not been uh, healed and raised up. Even in 1948, it hasn't been healed and raised up. Israel is an apostate nation right now. They don't believe in Jesus Christ or the true God. So they haven't been healed and raised up. 1948 is nothing. It just is a means that, they're getting, that the Lord is getting things ready to get Israel back on stage. Everybody tries to date the rapture according to 1948. Stop it. 
Israel is, a, for all practical purposes, a beast nation like any other Gentile nation. They could care less about God. 1948 is just God finally getting the Jews back into the land because He's going to prepare them for what's coming with the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation. So don't date things according to 1948. So this thing about Israel being torn and smitten, that's going to be the Great Tribulation, which I'll get to in a second. Then them being healed and raised up is the Millennium. Because we know that the Great Tribulation is called Jacob's Trouble. They're going to be torn and smitten by the Antichrist, the lion with the, the teeth of a lion, the feet of a bear, and the mouth of body of a leopard. You know, they're going to get torn up. Okay? And then uh, Jesus Christ is going to raise them up. Alright? So, if chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 is a reference to the tribulation in the millennium, then what is chapter 5, verse 15 referring to? I, Jehovah speaking, will go. When did Jehovah ever go somewhere and then return to his place? Would that not be the advent of Jesus Christ? Would that not be, I will go, Jehovah will go, Jesus was sent down to the earth, was born in a manger in Bethlehem, lived 33 and a half years, and then was crucified, and returned to my place? What's Jehovah's place? It's heaven. Okay, this isn't me just uh, sticking in my own interpretation. What else does that po could that possibly mean? Right? Jehovah returns to his place. That's Matthew 28 with the ascension. Uh, Jesus returned to heaven after he raised from the dead. How long is Jehovah going to be back at his place for? Answer, till they, Israel, acknowledge their offense. The offense that sent Jehovah back to his place. What offense was that? The crucifixion. You've got it all right here in this verse. That's very interesting. Uh, the offense of the Jews is crucifying Jesus. He says, I'm going to be back up in heaven until they acknowledge that they crucified me. And number two, seek my face. That's how long God will be gone for. The Jews as a nation have not seeked God's face since the day that they shouted, crucify him, we have no king but Caesar. They might think that they're seeking God's face, but they're not because they don't have the right God. Jesus is God. Whoever they're praying to at the wailing wall is not the true God. Jesus Christ is, is God. The Lord says, I don't know who you're praying to. You're not praying to me. <laughs> and the Jews would agree. We're not praying to Jesus, right? At the wailing wall. So they haven't seeked Jesus' face. Because Je Jehovah in the passage is the one that they did the offense against. Okay? So the Jews have not sought God's face, otherwise God would have returned. All right? He says, in their affliction, that's going to be a reference to the great tribulation throughout the Bible, they will seek me early. Okay? So the scripture prophesies over and over that what's going to happen is the nation of Israel will repent and get right with God in the last days after the suffering and the affliction caused by the Antichrist during the great tribulation. All right, so we have that. So now let's consider this timeline. Now, I don't have time to go into all the details of all these things. So this morning I'm going to take for granted things that I've taught you before. But I'm going to take for granted the pre-tribulation rapture of born-again believers uh, uh, just prior to the Great Tribulation. Pre-tribulation rapture of the church. Okay, Pre-tribulation rapture, taking that for granted. I'm also taking for granted a literal interpretation of the prophecies and events of the book of Revelation. I'm also taking for granted the restoration of the literal nation of Israel. I'm taking that for granted. And I'm also taking for granted a pre-millennial visible return of Jesus Christ at the second advent. Okay, So I'm taking those things for granted. And if some of those terms go over your head, that's all right. We'll deal with some of these things as we go. Now, based on the dates given in the Bible, the earth is roughly 6,000 years old. Uh, there's roughly 4,000 years. Let's see, I should probably put it down here. There's roughly 4,000 years accounted for in the Old Testament. There's roughly uh, 2,000 years, we'll just say, question mark, accounted for since uh, Calvary to... Uh, just about where we're at now. And that puts us right around the 6,000 year mark where we're at right now. And um, based on Revelation 20 verse 3, we also know that after Jesus returns, he's going to reign for 1,000 years, right? Okay? And then there's, there's the destruction of the heaven and the earth, and then God creates a new heaven and a new earth. So that accounts for, from the creation to the recreation, roughly 7,000 years. Does that make sense? All right. 
So as far as where you are at on the timeline, you are here. Or maybe I should put one of those little Google little dots things. You know, you are here. <laughs> You're right up almost to the rapture. It's almost been 2,000 years. All right? So many Christians uh, have different opinions on the exact date of the Lord's return and when they think it'll be. But the one thing that pretty much we all agree on is that the Lord's return is soon. You know, whether it's a post-tribulation or a pre-tribulation rapture that you believe in, we all pretty much agree that the, the, end, the end is here. We are right almost at the very edge. Now, when it come, and, and that's becoming more and more apparent by the day. Now, when it comes to the tribulation, I have to cover this real fast. When it comes to the length of the tribulation period, there are two main theories. Uh, the main, there's the, th the seven-year theory. And the seven-year theory is essentially that there's going to be a rapture. And then there's going to be three and a half years of peace. And then three and a half years of great tribulation. And then Jesus is going to come back. Okay, um, And that's the seven-year theory. It states that six 69 weeks of Daniel's prophecy have already occurred. There's one week left. Each day for the week equals one year. So thus, seven years. Three and a half years of peace. The Antichrist is going to make a peace agreement with the nation of Israel. And then in the middle of the week, he's going to break that peace agreement. Then there's going to be three and a half years of great tribulation. All right. Uh, the th then there's also the three and a half year only theory. Now, these two theories are hundreds of years old. Neither one of these are new. There's a little nuances that might be new. But uh, the other theory is that it's going to be rapture and uh, basically rapture three and a half years second advent. You know, there's a little bit of a give and take on the exact timing of that. But for the most part, there, the other theory is that it's Antichrist uh, shows up in the temple. We see him in the temple, I guess. And then there's a rapture and then three and a half years of great tribulation for the Jews. And then Jesus returns to the second advent. All right. That theory takes into account the belief that Jesus, the Daniel 69th week started with Jesus' baptism. And then there's three and a half years until Jesus, of Jesus' ministry until his crucifixion. So now all that's left is half a week of Daniel's 70th week. Okay? Three and a half years. All right? So the first three and a half years goes here with that theory. The last three and a half years goes here. Okay? Those are the two predominant theories. And both of those uh, theories, as uh, you know, I've told you in the past, and I'm not going to mince words, I, th I personally think both of those theories are inaccurate based on my own studies. I'm, I'm convinced that there's a third theory that is a, a, I'll just, like I said, it's like, how do you say these things without coming across arrogant? You know, it's like, this is a new theory. What am I supposed to say? It's, it's like, uh, I published this theory in 2017 in a book that I titled The Time of the End, and a lot of you are familiar with it. And um, it's, it's, not that I, it's not that I think I'm so smart. It's just I've looked for this theory elsewhere, and I, I haven't found it. So the theory that I published in 2017 is this. Indeed, Jesus' baptism was the start of Daniel's 69th week. And he went uh, three and a half years until his crucifixion. And there's only three and a half years left to be fulfilled on Daniel's 70th week. But I don't believe that the three and a half years starts with the rapture of the church. There's nothing in scripture that says it has to. I believe that there's going to be a seven year beginning of sorrows. Okay, Rapture, seven, and a, seven years beginning of sorrows, three and a half years of great tribulation, and then the second advent. Like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to come across arrogant. I know it's like almost impossible. People are going to say, well, you just think you're smart. I don't. I, just, I, I, I studied this for a very long time. I saw a lot of uh, discrepancies with the seven-year theory and the three-and-a-half-year theory that I couldn't rectify with the Bible. And frankly, the people that endorsed those theories couldn't rectify either. And so finally, I just said, i got to go back to the drawing board and see if we can find something that actually fits. And this thing, so far, in my experience, has fit, and a lot of people that have checked me out on it uh, haven't been able to contradict it. So if you can, and you're tuning in online, and you, want, and you can blow me out of the water, please do. I've been waiting for somebody to do that. So far, I'd be happy to blow myself out of the water. If it's not true, I don't want to believe it. But so far, that fits better than anything else. All right? So, to state it simply, like I said, the three and a half year ministry of Jesus Christ occurred. There's three and a half years left, but there's going to be a gap between the rapture of the church and the start of the Great Tribulation. And I think that gap is seven years. All right? So, you have a total of seven years beginning of sorrows, three and a half years for a perfect ten and a half years from the rapture of the church in the spring to the second advent of Jesus Christ in the fall. All right? Ten and a half years. So, 
What did Jesus say would happen during the beginning of sorrows? Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Like I said, the reason why I state that I came up with it is more for your sake, because you, that way you're not under the impression that there's a bunch of people that teach this. There's really not. So if you think that... Uh, so, so that way that's the disclaimer. Like, okay, well this is Matt's theory. I don't have to believe it. That's true. All right? So just, just so you know, you don't have to believe it, but this is how I teach it. And I believe this fits. All right, Matthew 24, verse 5. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. The end. The three and a half year great tribulation is not yet. There shall be famines, verse 7, and pestilences, and earthquakes, and diverse places. All of these are what? The beginning of sorrows. Okay? And then, if you skip to verse 15, Jesus says this, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Verse 17, skipping ahead a little bit, for then shall be great tribulation. Then shall be great tribulation. Does the great tribulation happen before or after the Antichrist stands in the holy place? After. Okay. So, uh, how long is the great tribulation? Three and a half years, right? So, when Jesus said these things are the beginning of sorrows, these things that he described in verses 3 through 14 happen before the Antichrist stands in the holy place. Right? Would we agree on that? Because if the Antichrist stands in the holy place in verse 15, and then it's great tribulation, three and a half years, that means that everything that came before verse 15 is... Not great tribulation, but beginning of sorrows. Now you know, here's the problem with the three and a half year only theory. Everything that happens in verse uh, 3 through 14 has to take place really quickly. Or maybe within a couple of months. You have to have earthquakes, famines, wars in diverse places, people delivering you up to kill you. That's 144,000 being persecuted. All of that has to happen in a really sliver of a, of a, of a time frame. The reason why these things, the famines, the pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places, cannot happen in the church age is because Jesus said, uh, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. There is no church age anywhere in verses 3 through 14. That is the problem, and that is a huge discrepancy that I found in the three and a half year only theory. I respect some of the people that teach that theory. But I, I believe it's wrong, okay? Because otherwise, you've got a thing where, well, we're, li we're seeing the famines and the earthquakes and the pestilences in diverse places. Jesus' words are being fulfilled. Well, we're getting close, but it can't be what he was referring to here because you do not have to endure until the end to be saved. That's another gospel that comes into effect after the rapture. Up until the rapture, you know how you get saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. After the rapture, you don't get sealed with the Holy Spirit anymore. You can call on Jesus Christ for salvation all you want, but you are not sealed, which means you have to endure. I don't have to. You know why I don't have to endure until the end? Because I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm already sealed unto the end. Because that sealing of the Holy Spirit, I'm sealed until what? The day of redemption. Whether I live right or not, thank God. All right, so notice the order. I can't spend too much time on that or I'm going to get bogged down. Notice the order. Jesus said there's going to be false Christs, there's going to be wars, there's going to be famines, and then the abomination of desolation, verse 15. What does that sound like? Where have you read that order of events before? How about Revelation chapter 6? Revelation chapter 6 with the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse, right? So you have the... Uh, white horse. Remember, that's the bowman. The white horse goes forth, and the guy goes forth conquering and to conquer. He's the guy sitting on the white horse. False Christs. Okay. Uh, then you have the red horse. You have a world war. Uh, it was given to him a great sword that he should take peace from the earth. And then you have the black horse, and you remember that was a horse of famine. There was famine, and they said uh, measure, two measure of penny for, uh, barley for a penny. See how hurting out the oil and the wine and all that. There's famine across the earth. And then the fourth horse is the pale horse, and that is death and hell. The writer is, is death incarnate, and hell follows with him, right? 
All right. Now, I believe those two accounts in Matthew 24 and Revelation 6 go together. Now, again, there's not a lot of people that teach it that way, but I believe, comparing Scripture with Scripture, those two things go together. And that means what you have there is the first white horse is the Antichrist. Okay? There are some people that teach that. Not many, but there are some, and I agree with that. The first horse in Revelation chapter 6 is the Antichrist, the man of sin. When does John see that writer? He sees it right after Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, where he hears the sound of a trumpet, and immediately he's up in heaven. That's a type of the rapture. And he sees the throne, and he sees the cherubim, and he sees the elders, and he sees the saints. He sees what's going on in heaven. What's the first thing he looks at when he looks down on the earth after the rapture? White horse. The Antichrist. The false Christ. The bowman. The archer. All right? Uh, the man of sin, as we know, according to 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, is recognized by the church right before the rapture. And after the rapture, he begins to be a major player in world history. He goes forth conquering and to conquer after the rapture, not before. Okay? Got to get that right. The church is going to recognize him, but he's not going to be a major player on the world scene until after the rapture. That's when he goes forth conquering and to conquer. Okay? And uh, for, for also, for what it's worth, I don't believe the man of sin is the pope. You know, heresy. Uh, that's a whole other story. All right, so that was the first horse. Now the last horse, get this, let's skip to the last horse. The last horse is a pale horse. It's death and hell. And I believe that's the son of perdition. Man of sin, son of perdition. Son of perdition, when the Antichrist raises from the dead. Just as Jesus was life incarnate, the son of perdition is death incarnate. And hell follows with him as described in Revelation chapter 9 with the pit, right? And the angel that, fought, that orders him around, Apollyon, that's the, I believe that's the, the son of perdition, all right? Or, or a spirit that's in him, all right? So the pale horse corresponds to the start of the Great Tribulation, and you know that because, like I said, I'm taking it for granted that you guys read your Bibles, but uh, I can't go into all the details of this this morning. You know that uh, the pale horse is the son of perdition because that's the fourth seal. The fifth seal is you have Jews being slaughtered beginning at Jerusalem. And what do we, Jesus just said in Matthew 24, when you see the son of uh, perdition stand in the holy place, you better run. Why? Because you're going to get slaughtered at, if you stay in Jerusalem. The fifth seal is Jews being slaughtered at the altar of Jerusalem. So that means right prior to that is the son of perdition. Fourth seal, Antichrist raising from the dead, death and hell. Interestingly enough, the son of perdition is the man of sin raised from the dead. And those two horsemen are the same person, right? They're the, same per the, the Antichrist is a man of sin and son of perdition. Same guy, just risen from the dead. Um, if you're going to describe a white horse that died and then came back from the dead... It'd be a zombie horse, so to speak. What color would that horse be? It'd be greenish, pale, dead, like a zombie. <laughs> White horse, risen from the dead, pale horse. It's interesting, the Lord, why did the Lord pick that color? Because it corresponds to the white horse, okay? That's why. It's a pale horse. A white horse that's risen from the dead and is Satan incarnate is pale. All right? So if the pale horse corresponds to the start of the Great Tribulation, then that means this. And I'm sorry if I'm going too fast, but if the white horse here is the start uh, right after the rapture, and the pale horse is right here with the start of the three and a half years, then that obviously means that the red horse and the black horse come between those two, right? Obviously. Okay, they have to go in order. So then that means that the war and famine occurs during the beginning of sorrows, exactly as you have it in Matthew 24. That's exact. Revelation 6 matches Matthew 24 verbatim, perfectly. So there's a ton of different directions we can go with that, and there's a lot of things we could fit into this template, but I can't do that right now. So let's go back to Hosea chapter 6, okay? Like I said, I've got to go, through, go fast through some of this. Uh, because I don't want to keep you here too long. But this is a pretty big Bible study. So, Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, the Lord says, After two days He will revive us, Israel speaking, and the third day He will raise us up and we shall live in His sight. Okay, so that resurrection of Israel is described in vivid detail in Ezekiel 37 with the vision of the dry bones and the Jews being re literally re raised from the dead. And that resurrection described in Ezekiel 37 and the raising of the dead of the Jews corresponds to the start of the millennium. Okay? 
start of the millennium. The revival happens after two days. Now, according to God's prophetic dating system, as you know, a day is equal to a thousand years, 2 Peter 3.8. We know that. So the two days of Hosea 6.2 can mean 2,000 years, and the third day would mean uh, the 3,000th year, if you will. Okay? So this is why... We infer from that prophecy and others that the church age is going to last 2,000 years from that after two days, okay? Um, the, uh, so, the, so it means, uh, now like I said, that fits the biblical pattern. After two days, you got 4,000 years Old Testament, 2,000 years New Testament, if you will, 1,000 year millennium, okay? Now this is why a lot of Christians thought the rapture would be in the year 2000, or around that time, and a lot of prophecy guys are looking for the rapture along the line of a uh, the lines of a clean two thousand years uh, because of these verses. Okay, but here's the thing: Hosea is not talking about the church, is he? Is he talking about the church? The church has nothing to do with what Hosea is prophesying about. So this this idea that the church rapture is going to land on a two thousand isn't necessarily correct. Uh, after two days has nothing to do with the church. It has to do with Israel. So the church age does not have to be exactly 2,000 years. The 2,000 years relates to something else. Hosea's prophecy was not counting two days from the birth of Jesus Christ either, was he? He was counting two days from what? The offense. Oh. You know, everybody was trying to date the rapture based on the birth of Christ. 2,000 years after the birth of Christ, if he was born in 4 B.C., that means the rapture must be in 1996. Oh, it wasn't in 1996. Jesus was born in 1 A.D. 2,000 years. The rapture is going to be in two, the year 2000. Wrong. <laughs> you see how they're trying to figure out these dates? That's where this is coming from. All right? You have to take this passage, and what it's saying is you have to count 2,000 years from the crucifixion to find the date, not of the rapture, but of the resurrection of the Jews. Right? From crucifixion to the millennium. That's what he was talking about, after two days. All right? So if you're trying to come up with a 2,000-year mark from the birth of Christ in 4 B.C. or 1 A.D., you're going to be missing the, the target. You have to count 2,000 years from the crucifixion to the millennium. All right? So that passage is saying it's going to be 2,000 years from the offense to the resurrection. 2,000 years from the crucifixion to the second advent. Two days. That's what that's talking about. So now we can start looking at some dates, all right? So whenever, like you said, when we talk, when we talk about dates, you know, the questions that always come up, and I got, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the questions that always come up as well is our calendar correct, right? Are we in the year 2021, or are we off by a few years? Our whole calendar is based on the birth of Jesus Christ, but even that is called into question because people say, well, he was actually born in 4 B.C. And then some people say, well, he was born in 2 B.C. Well, some people say he was born in 1 A.D., Right? The whole B.C. A.D. thing is based on B.C. before Christ, A.D. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Okay, so the big question is: Is our calendar even right? How are we going to know? Right? Um, there's a big debate on that thing, and that's a whole another subject for another time. If Jesus was born for B.C., then it's argued: Well, we're not in the year 2021; we're in the year 2017. You see how that works? So you got to bring that factor into account. Um, I personally think we are, our calendar is right, and I don't have time to go into why I think that, but I do believe it is the year 2021, all right? So I take for granted that God has preserved our calendar, but uh, when I, when I uh, published the book back in 2017 on the time of the end, in the last chapter I explained the return of the Lord based on Hosea chapter 5 and chapter 6, and I made an error in my calculation. I figured, well, you got the uh, birth of Jesus Christ in uh, 1 A.D., and so he was, lived 33 and a half years, so he must have been crucified in 33 A.D. That's what most of us say, he was crucified in 33 A.D. And so I go, well, 2,000 years from 33 A.D. puts you in 2033 A.D., right? So the second advent is 2033 A.D. So if you want to find out the day of the rapture, all you have to do is find out how long the, the tribulation is. And according to my theory, it's ten and a half years. So 2033 in the fall minus ten and a half years puts you in 2023. And I had the rapture being in 2023. That's how I came up with that. The spring of 2023. Based on Hosea. But here's the thing. I found out I made a slight error <laughs> that I think a lot of us have made, actually. A lot of people, not just me. It's just, this is a common mistake that we all make. And it's interesting. Um, 
if Jesus was born, okay, let's say in 1 AD, right? If we, if we take that approach, not 4 BC, we'll forget about all that for now. 1 AD. When you're born and you're six months old, are you called a one-year-old? You're not called one until the following year, right? So Jesus, if he was born in 1 AD, when would he be one years old? 2 AD. He'd be 2 and 3 AD. He'd be 3 and 4 AD. When he was crucified at 33 years old, how, what year would it be? 34 AD. But then again, if you take into account that he was born in the fall, and then six months later was crucified in the spring at Passover, you have to account for another turn of the year. So that puts the crucifixion of Jesus Christ not in, 20, uh, not in 33 AD, it can't be, if you have his birth at 1 AD. His crucifixion, if you do the math, has to be, tw uh, gosh, has to be uh, 35 AD. If he was born in 1 BC, or <laughs> 1, 1 AD, he, was, he would have been crucified 33 and a half years later, and it would have been 35 AD. Uh. I didn't catch that when I published that, so now I'm going to have to make a second edition. All right? <laughs> so you've got that. All right? So that changes things. All right? So uh, let me see what I want to do with that. Um, yes. Okay. So that would mean if he was born in, or if he was crucified in 35 AD, you add 2,000 years based on Hosea's prophecy, and that puts the second advent at 2035. AD. Okay? And then you subtract ten and a half years from that, and that would put the rapture at twenty twenty-five AD. Hmm. Hmm. But then there was something else that I caught. <laughs> so I'll show you something. Remember how Joseph is the greatest type of uh, Jesus in the Bible in over 130 particulars? Remember that? Um, remember how his betrayal is a stunning portrayal of Jesus' crucifixion? Remember how Joseph's reconciliation with his brother, brethren is a perfect picture of the second advent? And remember in Joseph's prophecy that he had seven years of famine, and then seven, or seven years of prosperity and plenty, and then seven years of famine. Remember that? It almost seems like there's a picture of the uh, end times in the life of Joseph. You know, it kind of looks like there might be something there. All right? So my question is this. What if a lot of those details are going to be recycled in the end times? On our end times chart, if we are going to insert seven years of, pro of plenty and seven years of famine... That would be interesting. Uh, now, this is all just speculation, but I find this an interesting idea. Okay, so if there was seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine, when would the famine have to end, according to prophecy? Would the famine continue on into the reign of Jesus Christ? No, by all indications, when Jesus returns, uh, by all indications, when Jesus returns, he, the earth is born again. Right? The earth is restored. There's an increase of, uh, of plants, there's growth, there's crops, remember all that? So there's not going to be famine in the, in the reign of Jesus Christ. So if there is going to be seven years of famine, it would end at the second advent. That would mean that you would have, uh, if this is seven years, the three and a half year or the, the famine would peak out, would be its worst three and a half years prior, which would correspond to the start of the Great Tribulation. And that would mean that three and a half years prior to that, that's when the famine would begin. Now what's interesting with that is if is that could correlate perfectly with the black horse. Because remember, the black horse doesn't start here, it starts back in the beginning of sorrows. So you would have a black horse, that's the beginning of the famine, after a world war, which makes sense. If you had a world war with nuclear weapons across the earth, let's say, which is plausible, would that not bring a global famine? It would start here, but it would peak out at the start of the Great Tribulation. And then it would end at the Second Advent. All right? And uh, you'd have a black horse and, uh, right, and it'd peak out around the time of the Mark of the Beast where you can't buy or sell without getting the mark. But if we continue that train of thought and insert the seven years of plenty, that would put the beginning of prosperity back into the church age and the prosperity would peak out at the time of the rapture, which is what I've 
I've taught before. I, I did a few lessons on preparing for prosperity, and I speculated that around the time of the rapture, there would be global prosperity that would be a sort of golden age for the earth just prior to the end times. Now, the other thing is it seems to me if this time period is called the beginning of sorrows after the rapture, then it stands to reason that this time period leading up to the rapture is not a time of sorrows. Right? It would seem like if this is the beginning... The word beginning implies that it starts here. It means to me that the time that precedes that must not be sorrowful, right? Otherwise, it'd be like the middle of sorrows. It would seem I'd make that argument. So it's interesting. But um, I want to make sure I'm not uh, messing myself up here. Yeah, here we go. Okay, almost done. Um, it. It stands to reason that this, if this is the beginning of sorrows, then the time that precedes it would be a time of joy and joyfulness right up to the rapture. And based on that concept, I've also taught and based my conclusions regarding the, of the four horns and four carpenters, if you remember that study I did, I thought and I was of the impression and under the uh, opinion that Donald Trump would win the 2020 election. Okay, this is what I thought was going to happen. Donald Trump would win the 2020 election and not only break the deep state like he said he would, but he would make America great again. And I figured over the next four years of his presidency, he would make the whole world great, leading us into a time of great prosperity, peaking out at the time of the rapture globally. Because Revelation chapter 3 has the church is rich and increased with goods that have need of nothing. That's not the Americans. That's the church worldwide. So you have to, in, in order, it would seem for Laodicea, there's a lot of churches that are not rich and increased with good and have need of nothing. You find that in America, but not really everywhere else. So it seems like there'd have to, for Revelation uh, 3 with Laodicea to be correct, that before the rapture, the church is wealthy, the whole world would have to be prospering. And that's why I thought Donald Trump would get elected, make America great, uh, diminish China, diminish the deep state, diminish globalism, and the whole world, you know, Brazil and the Philippines, all these nations that love conservatism and, and national sovereignty, there'd be a resurgence of that, you know, there'd be wealth, and uh, the whole world and the church would be very wealthy. And then Joe Biden. <laughs> and then... The election was stolen, you know. <laughs> so, you know that. Now, admittedly, that was quite a surprise to me, and uh, we're seeing anything but global prosperity. What we're seeing is actually uh, it looks like uh, it looks like the Great Tribulation. I don't believe it is. I don't believe these vaccine passports are the mark of the beast. I think this whole thing is a beta test. But uh, it, we are not seeing global prosperity right now. When Donald Trump became a president, it was a true miracle in 2016. When Joe Biden became president, it was a true miracle, except in reverse, right? And the impossibility of both of these events is so incredible that it's clear to me that God is doing something major in history right now, right before our eyes. And the seasons, the times and the seasons, as the Bible speaks of, are changing before our eyes, and I find that very interesting. Now, I don't know about you, but I want to know what God is doing. Because we've seen two, I mean, we get used to it because we've seen it in the news, we've lived through it, oh yeah, more talk about politics. You have to understand that America is a major factor in the earth, in world history, and this election, two impossible, miraculous things happened. That's worth noting. That's not just something to go into the dust of history. That's a big deal. That's like Cyrus sending the Jews back to Israel. And I'm, you know, there's a Donald Trump, Cyrus, all that stuff. I'm not necessarily, not necessarily saying that. But uh, it's a big deal. What I'm saying is it's a big deal. You know, the death of Alexander, that was a big deal. These changing of the guards, it's a big deal, right? So this is a big deal. It's easy to say that God is done with America and is in the process of destroying it, but I think it's a little more complex in my opinion. Um, I could be wrong, and I could be completely off in my conjectures, but I will say that what, I base, what I'm going to say here, what I base my conjectures on, is not on the news, but on what I perceive from the Bible. All right? And uh, because I saw this four horns and four carpenters thing in the Bible, and I've been pondering this prosperity at the time of the rapture, I see that from the Bible... I have a hard time dismissing it, regardless of what I see in the news, regardless of this totalitarian communism that's sweeping over our country, the specter of communism descending on America. And I know things are getting bad, but like I said, what do you do with Revelation chapter 3? You know, where the church is prospering. The body of Christ doesn't care about Jesus. They're just having a great time with their money. And the true Bible believer, the other type of the rapture in the Bible, is the Apostle John, and he's being social distance on the island of Paphos. So, it's interesting. All right? So, Trump being the third carpenter really seems to fit. 
I still hold to that, even though things look pretty impossible at this point. But I'm still thinking there's a possibility. And the seven years of prosperity and the seven years of famine really seem to fit. But obviously, if that were true, we should be seeing prosperity right now, but we're not. So if the rapture happened today or any time during the next four years of the Biden pres presidency, I seriously doubt the world is going to be seeing prosperity. Would you agree? I think we're going to be, if, if everything goes as it's going, uh, we'd be raptured in a time of global totalitarianism and darkness in a second uh, dark age, right? And uh, the church would be raptured at a time of global instability and chaos, not prosperity. Right? Right? Okay. So that's worth uh, considering. Now that could happen. The Lord could take his bride out in a time of global instability. I don't rule that out. But there's one detail in all of this prophecy in Hosea 5 that I've known about for years, but I've never known what to do with it. And this one little word in Hosea's prophecy I've seen, I've known about, and I've pondered on, but I couldn't adequately explain it. And since I didn't have the answer for it, I had to set it on the shelf. But the other day as I was doing my Bible reading, I was in Hosea, just reading through like I normally do in my Bible. And suddenly, as I came across this passage, a thought came to me that might explain a mysterious word in this passage that might answer the problem of what we have right here. Because like I said, if this is going to be 2035... And the rapture is in 2025, this prosperity and uh, famine thing is not going to fit because we are in the year 2021 and we are not seeing prosperity. No way. So we got a problem. But look at this I will go and return to my place, and uh, till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face in their affliction, they will seek me early. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us, he hath smitten and he will bind us up. Now look at this next verse. At two days he will revive us. Is that what it said? It said, after two days he will revive us. In the third day he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. I've always interpreted that passage as at two days or at the 2000 year mark. In other words, crucifixion 35 AD, two days 2035 AD, second advent. That would be at two days. In the third day, thousand years, he will raise us up. That's how I interpreted it. At, not after. The verse says after. But if the second advent is more than 2,000 years after the crucifixion, how much more is it? Is it 2,200 years? 2,500 years? 2,800 years? What does after mean? Right? It says after, not at. So the idea that it's crucifixion exactly 2,000 years to the second advent doesn't really meet, match the scripture, because that would be at, not after. So it's 2,000 years plus some to the second advent. But how long? Right? Well, what's the key to interpreting scripture? I promise I'm almost done. It's comparing scripture with scripture. Right? So what does after mean? If we're going to get the date of the second advent and thus figure out the date of the rapture, we have to know how long it's going to be from the crucifixion to the second advent. He said it's, it's more than 2,000 years. He didn't say it's exactly 2,000 years. It's after 2,000 years. How much farther after? Well, I've never known. <laughs> I've always wondered that. I have no idea. But then I came across something the other day. Hold your finger there in Hosea and turn to Daniel chapter 9. This word after appears in another notable prophecy that relates to the first and second advents. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. A very interesting, comparing scripture with scripture. I think I know how far, how long after 2,000 years the Lord's going to appear. Look at uh, Daniel 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince, that's the coming of Jesus Christ, the, 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 not the birth, but the uh, baptism, uh, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. And after three... To See, it didn't say at. It doesn't say at threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. That's how the seven-year tribulation guys interpret it. They say 69 weeks from the beginning of the building of Jerusalem to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And that leaves seven years left. The verse didn't say at three score and two weeks. It said after three score and two weeks. So the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is 
is after, it's not at. And it's three and a half years after, because look, it says, Three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people that prince shall, shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he, Jesus, shall confirm the covenant with many, the Jews, for one week. That's what he started to do when he began his ministry at his baptism. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years later, he, Jesus, shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease... And for the overspreading of abominations, he, Jesus, shall make it the temple desolate, the sacrifice desolate. How did Jesus make the sacrifice desolate? By dying on the cross and ripping that veil in half. Not one single lamb sacrificed from then on meant anything to God. But his crucifixion was not at 69, 69 weeks. It was after, right? His crucifixion was not at 69 weeks. His crucifixion was at 69 and a half weeks. The after, get this, the after meant half a week. 69, and a, 69 weeks was his baptism. Three and a half years he was crucified. After 69 weeks. So after, in the scripture in Daniel chapter 9, after equals three and a half years. Oh. Now let's take that equation and stick it in Hosea. Let's stick that in Hosea. Okay. Hosea chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. After two days. In other words, Hosea's prophecy is after two days. In other words, two thousand three and a half years later... He will revive us. You say, where are you getting that? From Daniel 9. Comparing Scripture with Scripture. The after in Daniel 9 was three and a half years, so I'm just interpreting the after in Hosea as three and a half years. So after two days doesn't mean 2,000 years. It means 2,000 three and a half years. See that? After two days, He will revive us. And the third day, He will raise us up and we will live in His sight. That would mean, according to this theory, that the second advent occurs exactly 2,000, three and a half years after the crucifixion. Which would also fit because the crucifixion was in the spring, so you need half a year to account for the second advent in the fall. All right? And that would mean what? That would mean that the Great Tribulation starts at exactly 2,000 years. You see that? Calvary. 2,000 years would land you in the spring of the start of the Great Tribulation. This Great Tribulation starts in the spring at the Passover, same time as when Jesus was crucified. Exactly 2,000 years, start of the three and a half years. After, like Hosea said, three and a half years later, we shall live in His sight. 2,000, three and a half years from uh, crucifixion to second advent. 2,000, three and a half years. So, that means my whole entire chart had to shift a little bit. That would put um, the great... Okay, so now let's look at the dates. Now I'm going to give you the dates. Watch out. Watch out. All right? So if this was 35 A.D., and of course we have to debate if the calendar is correct, all this stuff. If that was 35 A.D., 2,000 years would put the Great Tribulation starting in 2035 A.D. in the spring. Spring. 2035 A.D. for the start of the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation, the second advent, will be, would be at 2038 A.D. in the fall. Okay? 2038 A.D. in the fall. If the church rapture is ten and a half years prior to the second advent, then that would put the rapture in what? 2028 in the spring. The spring of 2028 for the rapture of the church. If that's right. Now, for those of you that are longing for the rapture, which I fit in that category, that's not exactly what you wanted to hear, because <laughs> that's still a little ways off. And I'm sorry to disappoint, but I'm not looking for a date that fits what I want. I'm looking for a date that fits what the Bible says. But get this. If that's right, if this date system is right, which, again, maybe it's not, but if it is, then the seven years of famine would begin in the fall, because 2038 minus 7 would be 2031, right? So we'll put our famine right here. 
2031 in the fall, seven years, right? 2038 in the fall. Now, again, I'm speculating about this seven years of famine, seven years of prosperity like Joseph. That might not happen. But if it did, the famine would begin in 2031. That's when the, white, the black horse rider would, would go. All right? The seven years of prosperity then would start in 2031 minus 7. What's that? Anybody want to say what 2031 minus 7 is? 2024 in the fall. And it would peak out three and a half years later, which would put you in 20... Well, the peak of it... What do I think? 20, three and a half years, 2027. I don't know if it's just I'm tired or my brain is worn out. I think, I don't know. You'd be in 2028. Exactly like I said there, spring, three and a half years later. The peak of the global prosperity would be at the time of the rapture in 2028. But if that global prosperity began in 2024, in the fall of 2024, can anyone think of something significant that could possibly happen in the fall of 2024? Um, can anyone think of something that might happen in the fall of 2024 that could result in global prosperity? <laughs> you know, presidents can serve uh, two terms, and even if they're the best president ever, they can only serve two terms. So I can't help but wonder, like I said, this whole thing is not put together so I can come up with my MAGA uh, theory. It's not like that. But there is one man that has the whole world united under him, and there's a huge global movement with parades for him in other countries that's never happened before. He has more people that come to his rallies than our current president could get, you know, at, at his, if he tried his hardest. You know, what's interesting is maybe God had a reason for not letting Donald Trump win the 2020 election. Maybe God wanted Trump, if he's the third carpenter, to be president not in 2020 to go out to 2024, because God has this plan in mind. Let's just say, I'm not saying thus saith the Lord, but let's say if this was right, and God already, ha and this is correct, and God already knew these dates, God doesn't want Trump's presidency ending in 2024 and some, some fool to get in after him. The, the global prosperity, if Trump was in charge and the deep state was broken and China was out of the way, you'd have a lot of global prosperity. So maybe God didn't want Trump to win 2020. Maybe God let Satan have his way and... Or maybe God himself overturned the election so that Trump could have his second term in 2024. And that would allow the globalists four years to develop their technology that's going to be instituted at, once again at this time. I think that's very interesting. They're developing the technology and the societal structure now that will lead to the mark of the, C the beast system later. And then that would allow Donald Trump to get in office in 2024, or possibly maybe somebody, another conservative like him in 2024, be president for four years, and the world be in a state of global prosperity. And the church, for roughly four years, three and a half years, will just be flourishing worldwide, with a bunch of riches and increase of goods, and have need of nothing, but it'll be apostate. And that's not necessarily a good thing. So I've said it before, I'll say it again, what's happening before our eyes is in the last five years is something very special and I think God is getting ready to wrap things up. I think it's worth paying attention to. And what's going on today is not all about Trump, it's all about the Word of God. And it's about what God is doing. And I think we're seeing prophecy fulfilled right before our eyes. I think we're literally living through the fulfillment of prophecy, which is really neat to th when you think about it. And uh, I, I personally like Trump, but I'm not interested in what Trump is doing because I like Trump. I'm interested in what is going on with Trump because I'm interested in what God is doing, and I love God. And I see God doing something very interesting. And as I look through the lens of the Bible, I see God doing something in this world that's very interesting and, and very worth uh, paying attention to. And I suspect that what God is doing has to do with maybe this right here. So like I said, that's all I got for you today. I know I went a little long, but uh, like I said... I didn't get that. I didn't, uh, I didn't jack that from somebody else online. <laughs> okay? So I didn't steal that from somebody else. That's my theory. Take it or leave it. Uh, you can call me a crackpot if you want. You can say, well, that's what he thinks. That's his opinion. Yes, it is. It's just my opinion. That's just my opinion. But I think there's some things that fit, and I think it's worth considering, but it's up to you to prove all things and hold fast to that, which is good. 
Thank you for listening to me. I'm grateful for what the Lord has done here at this church and what the Lord's allowed me to do in Oregon over the last 10 years. I'm excited about the next chapter of our lives, and uh, we'll be praying for you, and I hope you'll pray for us. And uh, let's end in a word of prayer. Father, I come before you today, and I thank you, God, for this book. God, I'm so grateful that you gave me the truth. And God, I don't profess to know everything. I don't profess to have your Bible figured out. But God, I know that the answers are in it, and I believe it. And Father, I know that, Father... Uh, uh, God, just you have all the answers right there in the Scripture, and I'm just doing my best to try to figure these things out. And God, uh, I believe that you're pleased with that. I believe that you're pleased with someone who loves the Bible, believes the Bible, and is seeking your hand in world history. And so, Father, I pray that this would be challenging to your people. And God, if, your return is, if the return of Christ for the church is not until 2028, that still puts us at seven more years of having to deal with things in this world. And if that's true, help us to be faithful until you come. Lord, uh, all the disciples forsook you and fled uh, right before the time of your great trouble. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to not be that way. The church at Laodicea was a church that you had nothing good to say about it. And God, uh, on a global level, it sounds like that's how the church is going to be. But I pray on an individual level, at least with the people in this room, God, that we'd be looking up and looking for your return and uh, not getting caught up with the cares of this life and the things of this world. But, Father, looking, uh, setting our affection on things above and not on things on the earth and laying up treasure in heaven. Help us, Lord, to be focused on what matters. Help us be focused on your book. Help us try to win souls. And thank you for allowing me the privilege of being able to teach your book today and, and God, over these many years. And, uh, Lord, I just give you myself and my, this future and whatever you have for us. We commit it to you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.